All right. Y'all ready for the word? Listen, I'm excited um, because I just truly believe that God is going to do something special this morning. If y'all can get, bear with me, eliminate distractions. I don't know if my wife said it. Turn your phone off, okay? Put it on do not disturb because the enemy is going to try to distract you this morning. He wants to stop you from getting this word on this morning. And somebody say it with me. The devil is a liar. Amen. So listen, I want you to pay attention because I believe this could be the Sunday that changes everything for your life. This is the one particular sermon or part of this series that I believe can radically change everything in our life. And how I know that is because I know a man named Jesus. The thing about it is, when you call on the name of Jesus, things shift. I want y'all to understand that. This ain't no hocus pocus. This ain't no superstition. I promise you, when you call on the name of Jesus. That was a little weak. I need a little bit stronger. When you call on the name of Jesus. That, woo, there's some authority that happens. There's power in his name. When you call on the name of, you can't remain the same. Situations got to change. Demons tremble at the name of. The Bible talks about on how when you call his name, he has the name above all other names. He has the name over depression, over anxiety, over cancer. His name goes above everything else. And at the name of Jesus. every knee shall bow. <sighs> Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. He's the only one that can fix it. You can't fix it. Your spouse can't fix it. Grandma can't fix it. Money can't fix it. Because if you could fix it, it would have already been fixed. But I know a man who specializes in fixing things, and his name is? Woo, y'all helping me preach already. I like when Romans says, he said, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. One last time, his name is? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Amen. Come on, let's give God a head cover. Pray right there. His name is? Jesus. Churches should be saying his name more. We can say all this other stuff. We can have pretty phrases and points and all that. But if it don't have Jesus in it, what was the point? Somebody say Jesus. Jesus. Ah, I love it. So this is part two of a sermon series we're calling, I Need What? I, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we can do that too. <laughs> Somebody say, I need... Jesus. All right. All right. But family, today's assignment for this sermon series is to encourage and provoke us to understand we don't have to stay bound in bondage. It is to help us. The point of this series is to help us realize and recognize that Jesus holds the power to breaking every stronghold that keeps us feeling trapped paralyzed and stuck in destructive cycles no matter how long we struggle or how deep the issue may run somebody say Jesus Jesus has the authority and the power to shatter everything that's holding you back God offers us freedom that isn't just temporary but lasting he causes transformation in every area of our lives where we felt powerless and couldn't change it. In him, we experience full and complete deliverance. Last week, I gave you the scripture in Psalms 18 and 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. And then he didn't leave us. He didn't stop right there. He said he is my deliverer. He deliver us. And I gave you a word for God called Jehovah Mapalti, 
which means my Lord, the Lord, my deliverer, Mapulti, M-E-P-H-A-L-T-I for my theologians and note takers out there, just in case you wanted to spell it. But the Lord is my deliverer. God, Jehovah Mapulti means that he can deliver, he will deliver, and he does deliver. How many believe that this morning? And when we're talking about deliverance, it is when God is at work freeing us. Somebody say freeing us. us. From areas in our life where we cannot get ourselves free. (laughs) Deliverance is God's divine involvement to rescue and liberate us from any form of spiritual, emotional, mental, and sometimes physical bondage. It's God's, when we're talking about deliverance, it's God's ability to remove any obstacles or barriers that prevent us from experiencing life as he intended. The Bible clearly states in John 10.10, the thief come to steal, kill, and destroy. But then Jesus picks it up and says, I come that you may have what? Life and what? Life more abundantly. I don't want just life. I want abundant life. (laughs) And you can only experience that through Jesus. Okay, all right, y'all got it? You cannot experience abundant life when you are stuck in bondage. The children of Israel could not experience the promised land if they stayed in Egypt. Okay. You cannot experience a fruitful, flourishing, and fulfilling life when you are held captive by self-sabotaging behaviors. Now, if you have your word, we're going to dive into some word this morning. Amen. Get your Bibles. Turn to Matthew 17. We're going to do quite a bit of reading on this morning. Like my wife said, we are doing a study on Wednesday night in the book of Nehemiah. And this previous chapter that we've discussed, we learned in the book of Nehemiah the importance and the significance on why people stand for the reading of the word. So we're going to practice that this morning. I need everybody standing. Now, I know everybody has phones and tablets and all these electronic devices, but we're going to read this word. Somebody say together. Put my scripture on the screen, please. Go into the sermon notes. You'll find all of these scriptures here. I'm going to be reading this from the, um, what is this? New King James. Amen. I'll be reading this from the New King James Version. Um, Are y'all ready? Matthew's the 17th chapter. We're going to start right at the 14th verse. And I want us to read this together. Let's start. One, two, three. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, wait a minute, pause, pause one second, go back. I want to I wanna just make sure y'all understand when we're reading the Bible, when you see a capital letter with the word him, do y'all know who they talking about? Thank you. Okay, all right. Bible study is over. Come back on Wednesday. And when the fathers came and the the man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, go. Lord, have mercy on who? For he is an epileptic and suffers severely. For he often falls into the fire and often into the water. Come on, go going. So I brought him to your who? But they what? Don't miss this. I brought it to your disciples, and they couldn't do nothing for me. Wait, go back one more. Can I just give you all one point? This doesn't have nothing to do with the sermon. But I want to show you all something, how amazing the Bible is. When you're reading the Bible, just don't just read it. Just take your time. Slow walk it. You know what I'm saying? When you get a nice Chick-fil-A sandwich, you don't just gobble it down. You just be like, mmm. Yeah, I taste the seasoning on that one. That, that was real good. Mm. You know what I'm saying? You take, you take your time. What I want you to see is the power of intercession. Uh-huh. Nothing, wrong was with, nothing was wrong with the man, the father. He went to God for who? His son. So that means you can go to God for. 
I just want to teach you something. You can go to God for your spouse, your son, whoever. Go to God. Not the disciples. Keep going. 16, 17. Here it is. Then Jesus answered and said, Oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. Bring that boy here. 18. And Jesus, ah, and he came out of him, and the child was from, uh uh-huh, keep going, watch this. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately. Wait a minute, Jesus, wait, hold on. Why couldn't we not cast it out? I love, I love the transparency and the honesty. Like, yo, they weren't jealous. They weren't mad. They weren't upset. They was humbled enough to go to God and be like, yo, um, yeah, how you, how you do that right there? Go to 20. Watch what he says. So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly, I say to you, if you have faith as a, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will, and nothing will be in. Woo! Go to the next one, though. However, wait a minute. I know I just said that about unbelief in your faith, but wait a minute. Let me put some more in it. However, this kind does not go out except by what? And? Ah, come on. Let's give God a head clap for reading of the word. Now I got one more. We're going to keep standing. Yeah, that's okay. I'm going to stand for the next 45 minutes. Give me, give me 2 Corinthians 10. Read this. Here we go. One, two, three. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war against the, according to the flesh. Four. For the weapons of our warfare are not, but for, one version says demolish or destroy the strongholds. Keep going. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against what? Bringing to the. Come on, y'all may be seated for the presence uh, in the house of God. Come on, let's give God a hand clap one more time for the reading. Somebody say, I need deliverance. Today's discussion, I want to teach from this thought, strategies for strongholds. Somebody say, strategies for strongholds. Ladies and gentlemen, whether you know it or not, we are in a war. A war that cannot be seen with the naked eye. A war that is engaged in one area, but it affects another area. A war that requires daily weaponry. A war that is disguised with coincidences. A war that can only be won with a sense of urgency I am referring to spiritual warfare. Ephesians 6 and 12 reminds us and says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness in this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Our fight is not physical. Our war is not physical. It is, somebody say, spiritual. Family, the Bible is very clear at communicating that we are all facing, battling, wrestling with an invisible enemy who is constantly and aggressively trying to stop us from experiencing God's best for our life. This is why 1 Peter 5 and 8 says, be sober-minded. Stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy. Somebody say great enemy. The devil. It was very clear. He ain't leave that out. He didn't just say great enemy and then kept talking. He said the great enemy, the devil. It's not your boss. It's not your girlfriend. 
It's the devil. That sounded scary, didn't it? <laughs> devil. Because he prowls around like a what? Roy lion, seeking whom he he looking for y'all. And the moment you start growing spiritually, the more you be consistent in church, guess what? <laughs> he smell that. And he looking for you. Somebody say, but the devil is a liar. I'm convinced that one of Satan's greatest strategies to keep us bound and blind and unaware of strongholds that keeps us trapped, he wants us to remind and uh, he wants us to remain ignorant uh, of the very issue that's keeping us in destructive patterns, causing us to live in cycles of defeat. Because I wrote this down, take this note down, you cannot win in the area that you are ignorant in. You cannot win in the area that you're ignorant in. When we talk about 2 Corinthians 2 where he says, uh, don't be ignorant of Satan's devices, Satan's strategy, Satan's schemes. That word ignorant is saying the lack of knowledge and awareness. It's like saying being in the dark. You ever heard somebody say that? Man, he in the dark about that situation. That means you're ignorant. You're unaware of something. And that is the enemy's trick. Satan thrives in our lack of awareness. Satan thrives because he's called the ruler of darkness. Satan wins in a dark. We don't. You can never experience God's deliverance if you are in love with being in the dark and refuse to step out of it. And many of us remain in the dark because we like the dark. It's a party in the dark. The diddler's here. <laughs> Just kidding, okay? <laughs> I was seeing if y'all, I'm just making sure y'all awake, okay? Amen. <laughs> John 3, 19 says, God's light, watch this. I want y'all to listen to this. This is why it's important to know the word. Watch, watch what John chapter 3, verse 19 and 20 says. Listen to me. God's light came into the world, but people love the darkness more than they love the light. For their actions were evil. All who do evil hate the light and refuse to go near it for fear their sins will be exposed. <sighs> Most don't like the light because it exposes their dirt. I'm going to cover this up. I, you know. No, I just want to stay on. To be seen, and you're trying to go through life, and that ain't working. That don't work. You got to be aware of the area that just was keeping you in the dark, was keeping you ignorant. And I hope you don't get disrespected like that. But I'm sorry. The Bible teaches us: don't be ignorant. Lee Satan has an advantage over you. That's the rest of that verse. So the longer we are ignorant, the longer he has an advantage over us. And how can you win a war when the enemy has an advantage over you? Okay, let's keep going. Can I keep going? This is why I asked last week when we talked about last week, the first part of uh, when we talked about deliverance in part one, we talked about are you in love with your issue? Because you will stay in the dark long enough because you like it. Oh, I love this. This is nice. I love it. Right here, you know? No, don't. <laughs> that, that, and you know, and this is why parents have discernment, and they'll tell you, that boy ain't good for you. Mm-mm. Uh, so, it's just something. They can't even tell you what it is. They're like, it's just something. <laughs> it's just something. I, he off. Something, something off. But you in love. You like the dark. <sighs> Keeps you blind. Because many in love, those that are in love with their issue, it will keep you in the dark and keep you bound by Satan's tactics, tricks, and strategies. Whatever area, write this down. I've said this before. Whatever area you are ignorant in, you will suffer in. 
Whatever area you are ignorant in, you will suffer in. Whatever area you are weak in, that's the, in, that's the area the enemy will attack. Why would I attack you in a strong area when I know you're weak in this area? You like Pepsi. I'm going to offer you Pepsi. What are we talking about? I'm trying to win. Nobody goes into a game like, I hope I win. No, I'm about to win. I'm going to do everything under the, listen. And that's how he treats us. And this is, the, this is his trick and strategy. Now watch this. If we remain ignorant about the strongholds, somebody say strongholds, in our lives, we give the enemy free reign to keep us bound to keep us oppressed, to keep us captive in areas where God wants us free in. This is important. This is why I brought up 2 Corinthians. Can you put that back up? Go back to 2 Corinthians 10. Watch this. I want to show you something because this, the point of today's lesson is the strategies for what? Strong holes. Give me that. Give me 2 Corinthians one more time. No, no, no. Uh, Give me four. Watch this. Here it is. I want y'all to get this. For the weapons of our warfare are not what? I mean flesh, like carnal. They're not of the world. But the weapons we do have are what? Mighty in God to do what? For the pulling down of what? Strongholds. Now, when I say strongholds, many probably think of um, strongholds as something that has a hold on a person. Like you'll say, man, that addiction really has a strong hold on this person, right? But that's, uh, that's not wrong, you know, but biblically speaking, that is not what this is, okay? Let me give you a definition. Biblically speaking... In the Old Testament, a stronghold, listen to this. I want y'all to get this. This is a good history lesson, Bible study. In the Old Testament, a stronghold is a defensive structure. It's a fortress. It's a fortified wall. In Jerusalem, they called it the stronghold of Zion. David said it like this in Psalms 9. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. A stronghold in times of trouble. Do y'all get it? So a stronghold is a fortress. It's like a wall that keeps you protected from the enemy getting in. Do y'all got it? They got the imagery. So when David uses the word stronghold, he's saying it's a fortress, a fortified wall that keeps you behind, away from the enemy. However, put that scripture back up. Don't don't take it down. Put that put that back up. Won't now won't. The Apostle Paul was writing to the church in Corinth, and he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, and the pulling down of strongholds. Now watch this. What Paul uses the word strongholds in the New Testament, he is using the Old Testament imagery to describe something that people, people wrestle with in their minds. Paul is suggesting that strongholds are not just physical fortresses, but mental fortresses. Watch this. Here's the second part that are set up against the knowledge of God. To identify whether or not you have a stronghold in your life, you must examine where you are resistant to God's truth. So a stronghold that we put in our minds is mental walls that we put up. Think of it as a wall in God's truth trying to get in. This is a stronghold. I'm trying to tell you, you need to work on this. No, I don't need no help in that area. I got this. Does that make sense? Because true deliverance only happens when you accept truth. That's when you're going to get delivered. It's hard to accept the truth when we see God's word as suggestions and not instructions. I want y'all to get this. This is some good stuff. This is why it's important to read your word. This is why it's important to know the Bible. This is why it's important to come to Bible study. Sunday is not enough. And you're trying to eradicate strongholds in your life based on just Sunday, one day a week. Somebody say that's not enough. Second Timothy tells us all scripture 
is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true. If I refuse to take truth in a certain area of my life, I may have a stronghold, a wall in that area. And if you want to know the truth about some things, you must read your word. You want to know the truth about marriage. If it's supposed to be a man and female, you must read your word. If you want to know about the truth about the family structure, you must read the I'm going somewhere. If you want to deal, you want to know how to deal with betrayal and deal with your enemies, you must read the If you want to know why God created you, if you have purpose in your life, you must read the The Bible says that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the mm, most struggle with God's truth because the enemy keeps them ignorant or in the dark from being exposed to the truth. So how does the enemy does this? He does this with this tactic called strong holds. Strong holds. Again, stronghold is a fortress that we put up in our minds that blocks God's truth. Now, here's a definition for my note takers. Write this down. If you like, take a picture of it with your phone. Put that, put that definition up for me. Strongholds. Watch this. Listen to this carefully. Strongholds. Our mindset. Somebody say mindsets. Unbiblical thinking patterns. Value systems. That means you put stuff in priority in the wrong priority. And ways of reasoning. Listen to this. That keeps us trapped and self-sabotaging behavior. <laughs> Let me read it one more time because for somebody in the back that may come in a little late. Watch this. Strongholds, our mindsets, unbiblical thinking patterns, value systems, and ways of reasoning ah, that keeps us trapped in self-sabotaging behavior. They are mental and spiritual fortresses, fortresses built on lies and deception that prevents us from walking in the freedom and truth that God intends for us. These strongholds influence how we perceive not just God. <laughs> These strongholds influence how we perceive not just God and others, but how we perceive ourselves. One writer said it like this, when the enemy can't get you to change the way you think about God, his next step is to try to change the way you think about yourself. And you can never experience deliverance in your life if you have a bad view of yourself. I can show you where the children of Israel had an opportunity to get to the promised land. But instead, because they didn't view themselves the way that God viewed them, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. Wasting time. Moses sent 12 spies. Ten of them said, nope, can't do it. Giants over there. I mean, they got some nice food over there. Big old grapes, land flowing with milk and honey. It's nice. And they're like, no, nah, but there's some giants there. We can't do it. Two of them was like, nah, let's go take it. Let's run up on them. Let's go. I want, we want all the smoke. Let's go. K -k -k clack, clack, bang, bang. Kitty, jitty. <laughs> Joshua and Caleb was like, let's get it. Ten of them was like, these dudes crazy. Let's stone them. They tripping. <laughs> but they understood the Lord is on my side. So when you understand that, you're able to be delivered. When you understand the value of God and who you are in Christ Jesus. Does that make sense? Okay, okay, let's keep going. So, 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 most don't have uh, a stronghold, watch this, most don't have strongholds about God, but many have strongholds about themselves, which are, again, mindsets, unbiblical thinking paths, value systems, and ways of reasoning that keep us trapped in self-sabotaging behaviors. It's the stronghold that's keeping you in the same cycle. I told you before, I said this before, seasons change with time. Cycles change when we do. And how do we change? The Bible says, be ye transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. That's how you change a cycle. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is strongholds are birthed or destroyed in the mind. Write that down. Strongholds are either birthed or destroyed in the mind. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down, to the demolishing, the destroying of stronghold, casting down. Watch this. This is why I say unbiblical thinking patterns, ways of reasoning, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, against the truth of God. You know whether or not you believe <laughs> what you believe, right? And I wrote this down. I said, Strongholds, uh, we don't have them in all areas, but we do have them in some areas because most of us struggle with strongholds. Let me say it like this. <laughs> most of us don't have a problem in strongholds when it comes to relationships. When God says, you know, there should be a man and a woman. Have children, multiply earth. You got it. I don't got no problem there, God. I got you. But when the God says it's a blessing to give, a tithe, you be like, wait a minute. <laughs> wait. Whoa, wait a minute. I don't know what the church doing with my money. I don't, I don't be got, I don't even have a lot of money. I don't even, th that could be a, I'm just saying. You don't have strongholds in all areas, but you do have them in some areas. And the only way that you can destroy a stronghold, the only way that you can pull down those thoughts is to replace them with the, okay. Strongholds will keep us bound in destructive habits and false beliefs until we destroy and demolish them and dismantle them by the renewing of our mind. Somebody say, I need strategies for strongholds. All right, here it is. The first step in engaging in spiritual and mental strongholds is getting equipped. You cannot defeat your enemy if you're unprepared. You can't pass a test if you're unprepared. I get on my kids all the time. Did y'all study? No, no, we got it. We got it. No, sit down, study. <laughs> They'd be like, no, we got it. We got it. We're going to pass. We're going to pass. They actually did, though. I ain't even going to front. Them boys, <laughs> them boys, them boys was like, oh, I said, wait a minute. What y'all got? What kind of memory y'all got? <laughs> they actually passed. I was like, okay, okay, okay. Touche, touche. So you can't defeat, you cannot expect to win when you have not prepared to fight. The more unprepared you are, the more pressure you experience. The more unprepared you are, the more pressure you, you, you experience. You feel like this is happening, this is happening, it, it, this always happening. I'm drowning over here. Nobody cares. I feel confused. I, I feel like I'm always trapped in the same cycle and always happening. This is all I, it, I it's always a rainy day. Da, 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 da. You keep going through that. You keep saying that. Guess what? You're unprepared. My question would be, did you pray that day? When the last time you spent time in worship with God? When the last time you, you just turned your phone off for a couple hours and said, God, this is just me and you? Go into the bathroom and say, Bae, I need about 15, 20 minutes. I need to get this time in with God. I did it the other day. I went into my room. I closed the door. My kids was running down the stairs. I said, God, block all that out. I'll try to spend this time with you. And I got on my knees and cried out. And I, I, I want to I help you right here. Your posture matters. When you're talking about engaging in worship with God, your posture matters. Whether you get on your knees, but the posture of your heart is, God, I'm coming to you humbly. And I'm trying to engage and worship with you. I need you to come down. I need your super to affect my natural and create supernatural results. Does that make sense? Okay, so when it comes to, when it comes to engaging uh, spiritual warfare with strongholds, watch this. I want to show you something. You have to be prepared. We'll go back to my the, the, the story with the boy and the father uh, where it talks about 
Uh, let's read. Let's go ahead. He says, he said, I brought my son to the disciples, but they could not hear, cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? Bring that boy here. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out. And the child was cured from that very hour. And the disciples went to him and was like, uh, how did that happen? He said, because of your unbelief. You didn't believe it was possible. <sighs> Write this down because I think this point here came from the Holy Ghost. Write this down. You cannot defeat what you do not have the faith to be delivered from. You cannot defeat what you do not have the faith to be delivered from. Somebody say you have to believe. And the point here, number one, I want you to get this point, number one. Write this down. The first step in overcoming strongholds and winning a spiritual battle the first thing you got to do is you got to get equipped in your faith. Get equipped in your faith. Somebody say, get equipped in your faith. Hebrews 11 and 1 says, now faith is the what? Substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things what? Not seen. Does that make sense? So faith is believing that God can and will fulfill his promises even when we can't see any evidence of it. You have to believe God despite what you currently see. You got to, oh, watch this, watch this. Faith is a spiritual force that overcomes great opposition and can carry a person through great trials and triumphs over circumstances in the natural realm. Faith allows us to connect with God in the supernatural in such a way that it allows us to override natural limitations. If you read that story in, the, in Matthew, Mark did this same story, but he gave a little more context. And in that context, the Bible talks about how the father went up to Jesus, same thing, and, but he gave a little bit more dialogue in Mark, I believe it's chapter 9. He said, uh, he said, uh, if you can heal my son. And Jesus is like, what? If I can. <laughs> Bro, who man, who man's is this? <laughs> I can just imagine Jesus like, Bro, what are you talking about? <laughs> you don't know who I am? <laughs> Bro. But he says, it's because of your faith. He talks about if, if you believe anything, it's possible. And the father humbly cried out to Jesus and said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief there's areas in our life where we believe God yes you can do it I believe I can get the job I believe I can be healed but then there's other areas like God I need you to help me with my unbelief this situation looks a little bit different than I was expecting I was not expecting this type of level of opposition and now your faith is dwindling what I like to call it is sometimes you've been doing a thing so long and you ain't seen no results, you get faith fatigue. You've been coming to church. I've been reading my Bible. I've been loving my wife. I've been giving her a gift. I've been talking her love language, and it seemed like it ain't working. And you like, man, bump this. <laughs> That's faith fatigue. And what I'm trying to encourage you to tell you, you got to get equipped in your and how do I do that? Watch this. Faith come by and hearing by. Faith must be the spiritual muscle you work to build spiritual strength. There's another scripture that talks about in Hebrews. The just shall live by faith. If that's the case, faith should be a lifestyle, not something we just believe here and there. It should be part of my lifestyle one pastor said you can't even get Christianity right if you're getting faith wrong faith is important 
Prayer is not effective without faith. Salvation can't be achieved without faith. God cannot be pleased without faith. Somebody say, it doesn't work without faith. You cannot demolish strongholds in your life if you don't have the faith that they can be pulled down. Somebody say it takes faith. So number one, you have to get equipped in your faith. Here it is. Number two, get equipped in prayer and fasting. Somebody say get equipped in prayer and fasting. So as Jesus talks about this, he says, hey, <laughs> It's because y'all don't believe. And, you know, if you believe and have faith the size of a mustard seed, and I don't know if y'all know what a size of a mustard seed is, it is very tiny. I mean, super small. So small, you wouldn't even know if it's in my hand or not. That's how, that's all it requires to believe, to shift a mountain physically, mentally, spiritually. All it takes is the size of a mustard seed. That's all it takes. And he says, if you can believe that, nothing will be impossible for you. I can give y'all stories in my own personal life where I believe God when it was like, it was rough. I tell y'all a story all the time about how I lost my job, bought a house on Wednesday, I had a good paying job, too. I mean, I was, this was the most I've ever made in my life. I'm in my 20s, and I'm like, whoo, your boy balling. <laughs> so I'm like, yo, let's do it. We bought the house on Wednesday, Friday. I got fired. Laid off. Income went from 70, 70 plus to zero. And I'm like, all right. <laughs> Wait a minute. God, hold up. Wait a second. Wait a minute, God. Wait a second. Let me think about this. I was going to church. I was going to Bible study. I was doing the church thing. And I, that, still, that adversity still happened. Because God allows you to go through things to test you, to make you stronger. So when the next trial come, I'm like, what you mean, bro? You don't want this? What's good? I'm going to be like De Aunt D'Angelo, his strong soul. Yeah, come on. What up? That next trial come, I'm, I'm ready. But it shows you, it, it's, it's to build, the Bible talks about how uh, 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 it builds character when we're tried. It builds patience. There's some things that God was cutting off me during that time, and here I am today. Oh, this is so good. So number one, uh, what was number one? Uh, get equipped in your faith. Number two, what? Get equipped in what? Okay, now this is one that people like to skip. Okay, not in this church, you not. Okay, here we go. Let me teach you good now. Amen. 21 says, however, I know we talked about unbelief. I know we talked about that. However, this kind does not go out except by Prayer and fasting. There are certain levels. You cannot defeat a level five demonic force on level one weaponry. It don't work. You'll be defeated every single time. Level five require level five or level six weaponry. And this is why I love this verse, this verse in the Bible. In many of the new Bibles, this verse is taken out. I don't know why, but... In the New King James and King James Version, I believe, not even in the NIV, that verse, that particular verse is not in the Bible, if you look. But it is in the King James and New King James. But he says, however, and it's a good point to realize, because most of us are trying to fight strongholds, and we don't have the level of weaponry to do it. You're trying to read your Bible and give scriptures that, I ain't saying that's bad, that ain't enough, baby. You got to do a little bit more. The disciple, listen, can I prove it? The disciples been with Jesus. He gave them authority to cast out demons. I can show you that. They was doing it. But this particular demon required a little more extra. You, you, my dad would say a little more, uh. <laughs> it, it required a little more, uh. And he says, this kind 
does not go out except through what? Prayer. And many people want the secret to overcoming strongholds, but very few people are willing to do what the secret requires. For some of us, your victory over certain issues is in your sacrifice. Prayer and fasting, when you couple them together, it w- it's a sacrifice. When I get on the prayer line every Monday through Friday, y'all think I be feeling like, listen. <laughs> it's a sacrifice to get up at six in the morning, dial in that number, and hear the lady, you've just reached the phone number, put your number in and dial the number. And I get on there and I hear my grandmother, good morning, baby. God bless you. How you doing this morning, man? It's 6.30. It's 6 o'clock in the morning. You know how bad I want to sleep? What? I got four kids. What are we talking about? Sleep should be part of my nature. <laughs> but it requires a sacrifice. For some of us, for some of you, your victory is in your sacrifice. Matthew 6 says, when you pray. He ain't say, if you pray. He said, when you pray, this ain't an option for your Christian life. When you pray, go into the room. When you have shut the door, pray to your father who is in in the secret place. And your father who sees what you do in secret will reward you openly. It's predicated on when you pray. I can show you another one. When you fast. uh Uh-oh. Same chapter, Jesus is talking. He says, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. Don't be looking pitiful. You know, people be fasting, they're like, oh, you know, <clears throat> I'm fasting today, I, I can't do it. No, he ain't say do all that. Brush your teeth, wash your face, act like you ate, but don't eat, okay? <laughs> but that's the whole point of fasting. <laughs> act like you ate, you didn't eat. Somebody offer you, it's crazy, like when you fast, the whole, the, the, the workplace, they be buying food, Jimmy John's, I'm like, bruh, like you couldn't bring that two weeks ago? You wait till today to bring Krispy Kreme, no, indo- whenever you're trying to grow spiritually, remember, it's always going to be met with demonic opposition, you think that's just a coincidence? I told you we in a war, ain't no coincidence. Okay, so he says, when you fast, it's not an option. Anoint your head, wash your face, so that you do not appear to men to be fasting, but to your father who is in the secret place. And your father who sees in secret will, again, reward you openly. I wrote this down. I said, your public power and success is dictated and determined by your secret time with God. If you want to experience power, anointing I dare you to fast and pray fasting and praying is the secret to your success it's the secret to a healthy and wealthy marriage it's the secret to raising your children listen you everything that you touch can be blessed because you fast and pray my grandmother is a fasting and prayer warrior like yeah I don't know if you ever seen like Wonder Woman like her, her physique and the, the long hair and all that. That's how my grandmother looked in the spirit. <laughs> That's how she looked in the spirit. Now, she's, my, my grandmother is beautiful physically right now, but I'm just saying in the spiritual realm, because she dedicates herself every month for three days, fasting and praying. She, listen, she is so blessed. And not because of that, but watch this. I'm blessed. When you fast and pray, it only just it don't just bless you. It blesses all your seeds behind you. Everything in your house is blessed when you fast and pray. Your children's blessed. Your house is blessed. Your enemies become your footstool when you fast and pray. There's something that happens when we fast and pray. The Bible says this kind, this kind, 
You need to evaluate the, time, the kind of opposition you're facing in your life and say, Lord, I'm going to dedicate three days. I need this monkey off my back. It wasn't until then I, God released me. I was struggling with pornography for a long time. And it wasn't until I started intentionally fasting and praying. Because I would do it, but that's because my mom, grandmother said do it. It wasn't that like I wanted to do it. It was like, all right, church doing it. All right, fine. But when I really did it for myself, that strong, what we call that? A stronghold of lust was on me. It loosed his grips. And over time, I ain't saying it happened quick, but over time, my eyes, there used to be a time in Tarian service that would say, take the taste out of my mouth. God, I need you to take the taste. I don't even want to taste cigarettes no more. I need you to take the, t that come from prayer and fasting. I don't want to look at this. And then what happened is as I begin to begin to walk through deliverance in that area of my life, soft porn was enough for me. I'm like, uh-uh, I can't watch that. Like I'm seeing two people kiss on the screen like, uh-uh, whoa, whoa, I can't watch that. Somebody was like, yo, you need to check out power. I'm like, let me see. Oh, no, 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 power's not for me. I can't watch that. My spirit is too sensitive. I can't be influenced by that. I've been delivered from an area. And what happens is, watch this, some of us can't get delivered because we keep walking into traps. You're stepping right into a trap. You got to understand that you got to put, you got to put some blinders on. You got to do whatever you have to do to avoid the tricks and traps of the enemy. And I'm going to tell you right now, when it comes to prayer and fasting, your spiritual senses get stronger. Your discernment gets stronger. You will know whether I can have this conversation with you or not. No, uh, I feel like this conversation is going a little bit left. I thank you. Goodbye. I can't, do, I can't do it. But that comes from prayer and fasting. Okay, all right. L let me hurry up. Let me, let me, what the, pastor, what the preacher say? Let me hasten to my close. Y'all all right? Okay, okay. Let me just give you this real point real quick. Prayer uh, is the most important activity for human humanity. Excuse me, for humanity. If Jesus was disciplined in prayer to be Jesus, certainly. We must be disciplined in prayer to be like him. Man ought to always pray and faint not. A daily prayer life is the key to a continued transformed life. You have to pray. Somebody say pray. pray. Now, same thing. When you're fasting, when you're fasting and praying, it puts your prayers on steroids. You get extra juice. I don't know if y'all ever seen juice. He's like, yo, he got the juice. You get, you get more when you attach fasting to it. Fasting is not an option. It's, it's, it's not just a religious act, but a relationship builder with God. When you fast, when you fast, you enter into a deeper and more intimate and powerful relation with God. Fasting, when done right, let me explain that. When it's done right, you will always experience and produce supernatural advancement. Only when it comes to fasting. This kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. And if you're, if you're dealing with a situation that you keep going in this same cycle, you keep dealing with the same thing, but you have not implemented the spiritual discipline of prayer and fasting, I would encourage you to do so. And see, holla at me afterwards and tell me what you did, what happened. I just want to know. All right. Get equipped in your faith. Get equipped in prayer and fasting. Number three, last one. Get equipped in the word. Okay. Now, this one is important as well. Get equipped in the word. Most of our thoughts are dictated by the information we consume. Thank you, baby. She got it. <laughs> Most of the thoughts that we have are dictated and determined by the information we consume. I just told you, I can't watch power. I don't need that information in my head. 
you have to be careful with the information you consume on the daily because what you consume on the daily, you become. God's word is, only, is the only information that can cause us to experience life-changing power. Somebody is in the word. Watch this. Last one. Here we are. We, we almost here. Hebrews says it like this. For the word of God is alive and powerful. Hebrews 4 and 12. Excuse me. Hebrews 4 and 12 says, for the word of God. For the what? Not no, not no history book. Not your psychological books. Your therapy books. The word of God. This is what the Bible says. It's alive and powerful. It is a sh- it's sharper than a sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between the soul and the spirit, between joint and marrow. Watch this. Exposing our innermost thoughts and desires. You ever read the Bible and then they start reading you? You read the Bible and be like, oh, wait, who are you talking to? Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Let me put that down. Woo, wait a minute, Lord. <laughs> huh. It start reading you, and you start feeling convicted. Ooh, I can't do this more, God. I did snap at them a little bit. And you'll start going through your life and like, hmm, the enemy does have me in a stronghold in this area. I do get offended easily. I am hypersensitive when I get corrected. It's funny. Like people be like, oh, I don't got no stronghold. Mm, cap. Because <laughs> it's funny. When the church corrects a person most time, let me just say, I've been in this a long time enough, we get offended. Now you dip. Now you go to a different church. You telling me that ain't no stronghold? You have an area where you get offended easily. I miss the old church when the pastor can disrespect you. I mean, stump on your face and you stay. You come next Sunday. (laughs) I miss them days. Nowadays, boy, you got to be careful what you say. You got to be politically correct. Nah, bump all that. Back in the day, they would stomp on you and be like, I'll see you next Sunday. <laughs> and then he's going to call you like nothing happened. I ain't see you in church this Sunday. <laughs> Pastor, you just dog me out. What you mean? <laughs> I'm not coming this Sunday. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> so we got, some, we got some strongholds in there. So the important thing is I want you to understand this. You got to get equipped in the word because the faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of what? The more you hear the word, the more equipped you are. The more you hear the word, the more equipped you are, the more your faith grows, the more your peace grows, the more your joy grows. The watch this, the more you get into the word, the more equipped you are in the word, the more you're able to resist the enemy. The Bible clearly tells us resist the enemy and what? If you don't know the word, you don't know that. So you're not resisting. That's why he ain't fleeing. (laughs) He's standing right there because you're standing right there. That's why I keep telling us, the devil is a liar. I'm going to leave you with this, and I'm going to end. We can can all stand right here. I want want, uh, 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 my grandfather, granddad right here, Elder Henderson. He gave me a nugget. I don't even know if he remembered this or not. Uh, But he gave me a nugget one day. You know, he, how old are you, granddad? How old are you? 94 years old. He told me this maybe two or three years ago. Um, and he said, just sitting right there, uh, he came to me at, when I got done. I don't know if I even preached that Sunday or not. But he told me, he said, come here, son. Come here, son. He said, whenever you get a negative thought in your mind, I've never forgotten that. He says, cast that thing down immediately. Do not let it linger. Because the longer you let it linger, the longer it can create roots. 
And once it create roots, now we're talking stronghold. Mindsets, unbiblical thinking patterns, value systems that are contrary to the word of God. That keeps us trapped in self-sabotaging behavior. That's a stronghold. And uh, one thing I loved about that, I'll be in the shower, a thought would come to my mind. Nope, not in the, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> I don't care. I, people would be like, I'll be walking by people like, Jesus. They'd be like, what's wrong with him? I don't need nothing lingering. You got to, we read it earlier. He says, cast down every thought that exalts itself against the truth of God. You have to cast that down. Don't let it linger. Does that make sense? All right. God bless you. Stand up real quick. We're out of here. We're going to pray. Look. I just want to make sure you understand. You have to get equipped in your faith, get equipped in prayer and fasting, get equipped in the word. The Bible says in Colossians 3 and 16, let the word of Christ in all its richness fill your lives. It's the word of God that's going to change everything for our life, for the better. And these are the tools, and there could have been many more. But these are the strategies you want to take when it comes to dealing with strongholds. Amen? I'll give you one last scripture, Ephesians 6. It says, follow me, dear brothers, be strong in the Lord and in the mighty power, in his mighty power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you can stand against the wows of the devil. That word wiles is strategies. So you can stand against the strategies of the devil. But you have to put on the whole armor. Don't go out there in pieces. He's going to rip you into pieces. Put on the whole armor. If you get nothing else from today, Know that you have to put on the entire whole armor of God. Now, listen, I want to take this opportunity for an altar call. If you feel like you are struggling in a certain area, you feel like you've been dealing with some things, I want you to come to the altar right now. Don't wait for nobody. Don't be looking at nobody else like, oh, I'm embarrassed. You better get your deliverance. The thing about deliverance is, I said it last week, how bad you want it. I don't care who looking at me. The woman with the issue of blood pushed her way through the crowd. She ain't care. She probably was stinking, bleeding, and all that. She's like, I don't care. I need this healing. I want to be delivered. I cannot live like this no more. I refuse to. And this is what I'm talking about. When it comes to coming together, having believers, the, the Bible also says in, in uh, I believe it was in Acts, where Paul and Silas was praising God in a jail cell, bound in chains, and yet they gave a praise to God. Them too. And everybody else got free. From their praise, it didn't just unlock their doors. It unlocked Everybody that was in the atmosphere. So I want you to understand the importance of praying together. There's power in praying together. One can chase a thousand. Two can chase ten thousand. Multiplication. Amen. All right. Let's lift our hands in the name of Jesus. Somebody just say Jesus. Father, we thank you right now, God. Thank you for the souls that's on this altar that's decided and made up in their mind, God, I want a difference in my life. I will not and cannot remain the same. God, we lift up our hands before you today. God, that you will come into our life, save our souls, God. We need you the more in the name of Jesus. God, we need the assistance and the power of the Holy Ghost. God, we know and understand that there is power in the name of Jesus. I love it, God, that his blood still works 
works. Your word says, when I see the blood, I'll pass over you. So, God, I ask that you cover us with the blood. God, surround us, protect us, give us a renewed mind, God. Remove strongholds off of our life, God. In the name of Jesus, God, there is power in the name. Demons tremble at the name. My mind has to be changed when I call on his name. In the name of Jesus. Say that, Ralph. In the name of Jesus. Say it one time. In the name of Jesus. Father, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for the power that comes with Jesus. We don't have to remain the same. In the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. We glorify you. You are worthy. You are Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Mapoti. You are our deliverer. Deliver us, God. Your word even says in our prayer, deliver us from all evil. Deliver us from all evil. Deliver us from old mindsets. Deliver us from bad thinking patterns. Deliver us from self-sabotaging behavior. Deliver us today we want to be transformed by the renewing of our minds in the name of Jesus and God we give you praise we give you glory we ask for healing those who need emotional healing in their life, those who are dealing with mental issues, those that are dealing with physical issues, God, heal those areas. Heal the secret area in our life, God, in the name of Jesus. And God, we thank you. We glorify you. We call it done in the name of Jesus. We call it done. We're going to believe it. God, we ask that you would increase our faith. Increase our faith for the areas that we're struggling. Restore the joy of our salvation, God. Help us, oh God. Help us with our unbelief like the Father said that when he brought his son to you, Father. In the name of Jesus, God, help us with our unbelief. Help us with the areas that we're struggling with, God. Help us in the areas that we're struggling with, God. We need your power. Nothing but your power can do it. It ain't our willpower. It's not that something we can do, God. We need the divine presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Fill our lives, God. Transform our hearts, God. We need a heart transplant. Take it out, God. We need your divine help. We can't do this with a nitrophyte. We understand that this is a spiritual battle and God we need spiritual weaponry and God I have not only prayed for those that is on this altar but the people that are connected to these people family members that are unsaved children that don't know you mothers and fathers that are far from you father in the name of Jesus God, I pray that you touch those that are connected to us. May they see the light in us. Draw them out of darkness and bring them into your marvelous light, God. In the name of Jesus. God, we know that Jesus is the only way. We pray to you, but we come in into you through your son, Jesus with the assistance and the power of the Holy Ghost. And God, we pray this prayer with sincere hearts. God, hear our hearts on this morning. We may not express everything to everyone. There's some things that's causing some of y'all to cry on your pillow at night. Some are dealing with some things that you are not telling nobody about. And God said, I hear that. I hear the cries of the righteous, and I'm here to help you, saith the Lord. And we thank you for your help, God. God, we need more of you in our hearts. We need more of you in our life. We need more of you in our home. In the name of Jesus. God, we thank you. 
take this time and worship God. Father, we thank you. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your power. Thank you for your anointing. Where would our lives be without you, Jesus? Help us, Father. Remove the pain. Remove the sorrow. Eradicate the sadness. Remove the resentment. Help us with the unforgiveness. Help us to forgive that person that betrayed us. Help us to forgive the person that hurt us. Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you help us today. We give your name all the glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus.